All right, welcome everybody uh, back to the 10th annual Stony Brook Sports Medicine Update. I am Dana Bennett. I'm a physician extender in the Department of Orthopedics. My background is in athletic training and I work with the operative and non-operative sports medicine physicians here. This is the second part of our 10th annual Stony Brook Sports Medicine Update. We wanna welcome everybody back. And if this is your first time around, uh, there'll be more information on the upcoming webinars at the end of this presentation. Our course description, the Stony Brook Department of Orthopedics invites you to attend the next webinar segment comprising our 10th annual Stony Brook Sports Medicine Update. Oops, I'm going back there. Women in Sports Medicine. This mini course is designed to cover the most current evidence-based practice related to orthopedic issues in sports medicine today. The focus of this course is on the knee. Our target audience is physicians, athletic trainers, physical therapists, physician assistants, students, and all of those involved with the care of athletes. Important reminder again, I just wanna make sure that everybody has the proper credit for attending this course today. I need you to make sure that you're logged in with your full name and title. Uh, the meeting is being recorded for future use with educational programs. So please make sure that you remain on mute and remain with your video off. Our presenters coming up today just want the best opportunity to give you a great presentation. Our objectives for today's course are to understand normal and pathologic anatomy of the knee, identify high-risk athletes for ACL injury and intervention strategies specific to females, and to discuss the autographed and allografted options for ACL reconstruction. Our presenters here, we have Dr. Brian Lynch. He is a fourth year orthopedic surgery resident who will be doing the anatomy of the knee with a dissection presentation. Dr. Stuart Cherney presenting on screening of ACL prone female athletes. And Dr. Jennifer Caselli. Doctor, I introduce you as Dr. Jennifer. Uh, Jen is a physician assistant with Dr. Penna in the orthopedic department. So we'll be talking about ACL reconstruction and our graft choice. To so the bottom right here, we have our great orthopedic crew. Uh, Dr. Cherney is on our far right, and Jennifer is third from the left. A few formalities, so for our accreditation for this, the CME is awarded from the School of Medicine, State University of New York at Stony Brook, is accredited by the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education to provide continuing medical education for physicians. The School of Medicine, State University of New York at Stony Brook designates this live activity for a maximum of 2.0 AMA PRA Category 1 credits. Physicians should only claim the credit commensurate with the extent of their participation in this activity. If you have any questions in regards to your CME or a certificate for it, you can contact Myra or Donna at the CME office. Their phone number is 444-2094. Reminder for physical therapists and athletic trainers, the Office of Continuing Education is not responsible for awarding C, CEU, or contact hours. You may obtain a letter of participation for hours of learning and submit it to your accrediting agency. The symposium qualifies for two contact hours as recognized by New York State Education Department Board of Physical Therapy. For proof of attendance, you can email Patricia. I'll have her email at the end as well. The School of Health Technology and Management, Stony Brook University, BOC approved provider number P3368 is approved by the Board of Certification to provide continuing education to athletic trainers. This program is eligible for a maximum of two category A CEUs. AT should claim only those hours spent in the educational program. And you can email Christos at the completion of this course for a certificate for athletic trainers. Our disclosures in compliance with ACCME standards for commercial support, everyone who is in a position to control the content of an educational activity provided by the School of Medicine is expected to disclose to the audience any relevant financial relationships with any commercial interest that relates to the content of his or her presentation. Our presenters today, the planners, the reviewers, and the CME office have no disclosures for you today. On behalf of Stony Brook Orthopedics, I want to remind you that the ER is not your only option. We do have an orthopedic urgent care located at our 14 Technology Drive Suite 11 office, Monday through Friday from 3 to 6.30 p.m. We do same-day care for strains, sprains, minor fractures, dislocations, and all sport-related injuries without an appointment. If you have any questions, you can call our basic call line and they can answer it for you. Just before we get started with our first presentation from Dr. Lynch, I wanna remind you that if you have any questions, you may type them in the chat box at any time throughout the meeting. We'll have a dedicated period at the end of the presentations to answer questions for you. 
Uh, one last reminder, a few of you just double check that your names are listed for purple, uh, purple purpose of credentialing and making sure that you get the educational credit. With that being said, I'm going to pass over the screen sharing to Dr. Lynch and he will get us started with the anatomy of the knee presentation. Dr. Lynch, are we in? Yes, we are. <clears throat> Perfect. All right. All right. Okay. So today I'm going to be talking about the anatomy of the knee, and it's a dissection presentation. Um, I'm Brian. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Uh, I'm Brian Lynch, and I'm going to be going through um, the anatomy, and we're also going to be trying to relate it uh, to some of the things you'll see clinically as well. As was said before, I have no disclosures. Just a minute. Oh. Is it coming through? Yes. Okay. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. So I'll continue on. So uh, in light of our uh, conversation coming up next, I wanted to give a video of a pretty infamous ACL tear. So this is Clay Thompson. As you can see, he's sustaining here a non-contact pivoting injury. And you can see in the second view right here that the tibia actually translate anteriorly and he's in slight flexion and valgus. So we'll get back to that a little bit later. And uh, first we'll start with some of the anatomy. So the knee is comprised of tibiofemoral joint and the patellofemoral joint. And this main function is kind of obvious. You want to be able to transmit the body weight from the femur to the tibia. Uh, it sees a lot of force. It sees up to three times the body weight with walking, up to four times body weight with climbing. It has a wide range of motion, anywhere from three degrees hyperextension to 155 degrees flexion. And usually the limited, uh, this limitation is limited by thigh-calf contact. Normal day-to-day -day life requires you to have a range of motion typically between zero to 70 degrees. Um, there's a couple of cool things about the knee. It's not a simple hinge. One of the uh, aspects of its motion is something called posterior rollback. And what that entails is as the knee flexes, the actual center of rotation, let me see if you can see my pointer. The center of rotation goes from more anterior to posterior. And what this does is it allows for increased knee flexion because it avoids the impingement that you would see otherwise. Another mechanism that the knee has is what we call the screw home mechanism. And what that entails is that the knee uh, comes to full extension, in the last 15 degrees, it actually externally rotates. And what that allows you to do is lock the knee, and it decreases the work that's performed by your quadriceps. So really basic anatomy. We're going to start with the bones. So you have your distal femur, proximal tibia, and the patella. So first is your distal femur, some of the bony landmarks. You can see here the lateral epicondyle, medial epicondyle, lateral condyle and medial condyle where you actually have your articular surface. And we'll get into a little bit more of the re relevance of this. This is just a bony uh, gross anatomy uh, sample. Uh, here's your proximal tibia, again, bony uh, landmarks. So you have Gertie's tubercle here, where you have your attached from the ITV band, anterior tuberosity where you have the patella tendon attachment. And we'll get into some of the more specific anatomy and further slides. And again, a gross example. So your patella is also kind of interesting. Uh, it's transmitting the force generated by your quadriceps uh, through uh, patella tendon distally to your tibia. And the mechanism behind it is it actually uh, increases the lever arm. Um, and it does this, um, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but here it actually increases the lever arm that you'd have for the extensor compartment. Kind of like this diagram here with a gentleman trying to lift a large uh, rock. If you, as you increase this, the force of work becomes less. And this is evident when you look at patients who had to unfortunately go through a patellectomy and uh, they actually have decreased extension force by up to 30%. So the patellofemoral joint actually sees a ton of force. It sees up to seven times the body weight with squatting, two to three times body weight with descending stairs. So it's important to, your knee, to the knee mechanism. So here's some of your bony landmarks for the patella uh, on the front on the left rather you're seeing the anterior view and then on the right side this would be from a left leg because this is lateral uh, you see the two facets for the lateral and medial condyle 
So when you're examining a patient, um, obviously it's good to get x-rays. And the reason for that is you wanna be able to see if there's any bony abnormalities that would preclude you from doing certain parts of your exam that may further injure the patient. So these are normal x-rays. On the left right here, you have an AP of the knee. You can see the shadow of your patella right here, overlying the distal femur. You can see the tibial plateau here, looks concentric in the fibular head. Then here in the middle, we have a lateral uh, of the knee. And you can see again, see the patella, distal femur, and tibia. And you can also see the proximal fibula as well. This is a sunrise view. It allows you to see the patella as it sits in the trochlear groove. And we'll get back to some of the significance of that. But the importance of recognizing a normal x-ray is you also want to be able to differentiate that from a not normal x-ray. So here on the left, you can see a lateral of the knee with a clear patella fracture. Looks like there's some comminution, not a simple transverse. And then here you can see a quite a bad uh, tibial plateau fracture. And it's important to be able to recognize this when you're evaluating a patient and uh, making sure that you have the full extent of their injury before you do any physical maneuvers to them. So this is a pretty busy slide, um, but I wanted to open it as we go into each of the specific ligaments of the knee. So first I'm gonna start with the ACL. So it originates on the semicircular area, the posterior medial aspect of the lateral femoral condyle, which you can see here, and we have better images in a couple of slides forward. Uh, it inserts uh, just anterior, anterior to and between the intercondylar eminence of the tibia. And you can see that here. And again, I'll show that a little bit better in, first or, in future slides. Um, there are actually two components to the ACL, the anterior medial bundle, uh, which is tight inflection, and this is what you test in your Lachman test, and we'll get to that in the future. And your posterior lateral bundle, which is tight and extension, and that you assess in a dial test typically. Uh, the function of the ACL is that you want to have a prior, it provides you with a primary static restraint uh, to anterior translation of the tibia, and it also plays a role in your axial rotation. So, this is a gross example. Um, of the knee, obviously, we have an arthrotomy here, meaning that we're looking into the joint. Um, but what you can see here uh, is your ACL right there, your PCL, and we'll get into some of the other aspects of the knee anatomy uh, in further slides. So this brings us back to the beginning with our friend Clay Thompson. So uh, as pretty famously uh, stated and seen on ESPN, he did the sustained an ACL fracture, uh, ACL, sorry, ACL tear. Um, and when you're seeing a patient with ACL tear, there's certain things you want to do to assess the uh, extent of their injury. So one of the things you want to do is what we call a Lachman test. You do this at 20 to 30 degrees of flexion. Um, you're taking and stabilizing. You can see with his left hand in this um, image here, he's stabilizing the distal femur with his left hand. And with the right hand, you're providing uh, an anterior force to the tibia. So it breaks down to firm endpoint and no endpoint. And then when you do have an endpoint, you want to be able to um, characterize that in regards to how much translation you're actually able to achieve of the tibia. So typically grade one would be three to five millimeters of translation, grade two would be five to ten millimeters, and grade three would be greater than ten millimeters of translation. There's also the pivot shift test, um, and what you do is you have the patient supine with the knee fully extended, and you provide uh, internal rotation and a valgus force on the proximal tibia while you flex the knee. And when you have the clunk of flexion, it actually indicates that you have the ACL injury here. Um, and the next slide will demonstrate this a little bit clearer, but the importance to understand with this is that the tibia starts uh, anteriorly subluxed, which is what you're seeing here. So the normal pivot point is actually uh, posterior here, if you're going by the femur. And as you convert uh, <clears throat> the knee into flexion, the IT band will actually provide its force reducing it, which is the clunk you feel as you get um, into flexion. So when you're looking at your x-rays, like we discussed before, and you're trying to assess somebody who you uh, think has an ACL uh, tear, there's certain things to look for on x-ray. Uh, on the left here, we have what we call a Sagan fracture. That's a, an avulsion um, fracture of the ALL, anterior lateral ligament. Um, if you see that, it's it's um, highly pathogenic of an ACL tear. You can see an ACL tear with this specific fracture 75 to 100% of the time. Uh, another radiographic finding on your lateral film will be here what we call a deep sulcus uh, sign. And it's a result of the um, impaction injury that you have when you sustain uh, your initial injury. So these are MRI images. And uh, what we're trying to demonstrate here is just, you can see here, 
a nice linear um, signal throughout the entire ACL, no significant edema, no signs of disruption. And here it's not very easy to see. This next image here makes it a little bit easier to see. Uh, this is an, a an ACL tear where you can see a clear disruption in the fibers right here. And in this uh, right image, they actually outlined it, uh, making it even more so obvious. So another thing you can see in the MRI is bone bruising. Uh, typically, this occurs in the middle third of the lateral femoral condyle and uh, the posterior third of um, the lateral tibial plateau. And this is uh, the same reason why you get that deep sulcus sign. You're having an impaction injury when your, your tibia translates anteriorly. So you have an impaction between the distal femur and the proximal tibia. So this is some arthroscopic images. I apologize for the quality here, um, but I like these ones because I felt like it gave you a good idea of what you see. This is a probe here. It's pushing a, a pressure on the ACL and you're able to see that the fibers are intact. Here are your condyles. And on the right here, you can see a clear disruption of the ACL. And again, your femoral condyles. And this is a probe uh, grabbing on or trying to uh, manipulate the ACL to prove that it is in fact torn. So I apologize for this busy slide, but I feel like it is important. Um, so when you want to assess someone with an ACL tear, you have to take upon, you have to take into consideration all the factors in regards uh, to their lifestyle and, and what they expect to be doing um, with their knee. So low demand patients typically um, with decreased uh, you know, lifestyle needs can be considered for non-operative management. Um, a recreational athlete who's really not doing cutting or pivoting activities can uh, trial non-operative um, intervention. And typically, if you do do those types of activities, meaning cutting, jumping, side-to-side -side sports, heavy manual labor, you're gonna have an unstable joint and you're at risk for increased meniscal or cartilage damage. And uh, it's important to make sure that when you're assessing somebody, that there's somebody who is actually amenable to this non-operative treatment. Because ultimately you're gonna end up further progressing uh, arthritis, meniscal damage, and pain. Operative treatments, uh, we're gonna get into further in the talk um, with my uh, following presenters, um, but uh, two of the main options are ACL reconstruction. Um, and one of the big things to note uh, beforehand is if, if the patient doesn't have preoperative motion, it's a risk for postoperative arthrofibrosis or stiffness, inability, inability to re regain that motion. Um, obviously, you're gonna um, be more inclined to perform a reconstruction on younger active patients, on children, and also older active patients. You know, it's not, it's, age over 40 is not a, a rigid contraindication, especially if they're in a high uh, demand athlete. And um, there's a lot of factors that are involved in return to play, psych psychological, demographic function. Um, so it's important to, to be aware of. Um, ACL repair is, is, not, is not very commonly done. Um, there have been certain uh, populations, like pediatric populations, where it's attempted. Um, there have been recent studies that are looking into it, um, but nothing definitive yet. Um, this will, will uh, be gone into uh, in further uh, lectures, um, but this is just showing some of the graft options that you have here. Uh, this is your uh, standard uh, bone, tendon, bone. You have gracilis, uh, semitendinosis, you have your IT band, um, but we'll get into that uh, at a, in a uh, future lecture. So moving on to our next ligament, PCL. It originates in the anterior lateral medial femoral condyle and it starts in the tibial sulcus below the articular surface. Uh, it also has two components, an anterior lateral component that's tight in flexion and a posterior medial component that's tight in extension. And it provides a primary static restraint uh, to posterior translation. So this is a posterior view of the knee um, as opposed to before when we looked at our ACL where we looked at it from anteriorly. And you can see here, here's your PCL. So this is a gross anatomy PCL again. So when you're examining a patient that you suspect has a, a PCL injury, you wanna do a posterior draw. And uh, what you're gonna do is you're gonna have them bend their uh, knee to approximately 90 degrees and you're going to provide a posterior force uh, to the tibia. And it's also graded. Uh, grade zero is typically less than five millimeters of translation. And you can see this on a normal patient without a tear. Um, grade one plus would be five to 10 degrees. 
Um, and you still have the tibial plateau anterior to the femoral condyles. And if you see where his thumb is positioned, that can give you an idea of how far you're actually translating back. Um, grade two plus would be 10 to 15 degrees where you become even with the femoral condyle and three plus is greater than uh, 15 millimeters and, and that's when you're posterior to the condyle. So the next ligament we're going to talk about is the MCL. Superficial MCL attached from the medial epicondyle, possibly one centimeter anterior and distal to the adductor tubercle and we'll show some of this in our uh, dissection um, presentation. Uh, the tibial attachment is at the proximal tibia uh, 4.5 centimeters distal to the joint line. Below that, or deep to that rather, you have your deep MCL, and that's composed of meniscofemoral and meniscotibial ligaments. And that's here in blue to kind of give you an idea of that nature. Um, they uh, connect directly with the meniscus. So the function of superficial MCL is that provides a uh, primary stabilizer, stabilizer to um, valgus stress at all ang angles of knee flexion. Um, and the greatest uh, stability contribution is at 25 degrees knee flexion. It also has other functions as well. Uh, deep MCL is a secondary stabilizer, stabilizer to valgus stress, and its uh, greatest uh, stability contribution is at full extension. So this is again a gross image of a uh, medial aspect of a knee. You can see superficial MCL. Can't really see deep here, maybe a little bit here, hard to tell. Here's your medial meniscus and um, here's your MPFL, which we'll also show in our dissection video, but we'll get back into this a little bit later. Next ligament we're going to talk about is the LCL. Uh, it originates uh, posterior and proximal to the lateral epicondyle, which you can see right here. It is also posterior and proximal to the origin of popliteus, and uh, we can demonstrate this in our video that will follow this presentation pretty nicely. Uh, it inserts the anterior, anterior lateral uh, aspect of the fibular head. Oh, I went forward, there we go. And uh, its primary function is to be a restraint to varus stress at five degrees and 30 degrees of flexion. Um, it also provides a secondary restraint uh, to posterior lateral rotation uh, with less than 50 degrees of flexion. And it resists varus in full extension along with the ACL and PCL. So this is a gross anatomy picture um, from our dissection, which we'll go into in the future. Uh, you can see here your ALL, here's your LCL, and um, nicely showing the anatomy here. So uh, uh, PLC uh, includes the lateral collateral ligament, popliteus tendon, and popliteal fibular ligament. So this works, popliteus works as synergistically with the PCL to control external tibial rotation, uh, varus uh, force, and posterior typical translation. And the idea is that the popliteus and popliteal fibular ligament will function to maintain, uh, function maximally in knee flexion to resist that external rotation. So here you can see your lateral gastrocnemius tendon. Here's your popliteal fibular ligament. Here's your uh, fibular head, LCL, as we discussed in the previous slides. And here's your popliteus tendon. And this is again. Uh, same picture from uh, our last uh, LCL gross anatomy slide. So uh, the next uh, anatomic aspect of the knee we're going to talk about is menisci. So they function to optimize the force that's transmitted across the knee. And they do this in a couple of ways. The meniscus, uh, menisci rather, uh, increase congruency of the joint. They increase the contact area, which leads to less point loading, meaning less uh, the greater surface area is going to result in less specific um, pinpoint areas of loading of the bone and the joint, and they also provide some shock absorption. So they transmit 50% of the weight uh, bearing load and extension and 85% of flexion. Um, they also dip deep in the tibial surface, and that provides you the secondary stabilizer. So the medial meniscus is a main stabilizer to anterior translation, and the lateral meniscus is less stabilizing. It has approximately two times the excursion of the medial meniscus. And as you can see here, the medial meniscus is a little bit, is, is larger, is more open of a structure. And that's due to the difference in the depth of okay, the So here's your gross anatomy picture. Again, you can see this wider. How are you doing today? Here's your. So next we're going to touch upon the muscles of the knee. Um, 
It's important to have an idea of your surface anatomy, of course. Now here's vastus lateralis. This is the lateral aspect of the knee here, medial aspect. You have your quadriceps tendon. We'll go through this in the following slides a little bit clearer. And um, again, patella, patella tendon, quadriceps tendon, IT band, lateral and medial retinaculum. This is looking at the pes anserinus, which is, uh, is going to be seen in our video. You can see sartorius, gracilis, and semitendinosus. And we'll go through this in the following slides. So this picture on the right breaks up the thigh into the uh, different muscular compartments. There's three. You have your quadriceps, which are your main um, extenders of your knee. You have your adductors, adductor magnus, gracilis, and then you have your hamstrings, which include your biceps, semi-T, and semi-membranosus. I'm talking about the blood supply of the knee, especially in our talk where we're going to be uh, considering ACL injuries. Uh, the main supply to the ACL and PCLs in the middle geniculate. Uh, your menisci are provided by the uh, medial and lateral genicular arteries. Superior aspect is from the superior artery, artery and the inferior aspect is the inferior. So uh, this is an MRI of the knee and I chose this uh, particular image because I felt that it gave uh, the ability to see a lot of the anatomy we had been discussing today. So first to start with uh, the larger structures, distal femur, proximal tibia, you can see a little bit of the fibular head. Then when you come more into the knee, you can see here uh, a little bit of your ACL. The other images we had before were uh, sagittal images and those gave you a better idea of the profile, but you can not see it here. You can see both menisci, and how they're actually how they're actually functioning to increase the contact area, and how they sit nicely uh, between the tibial and uh, femoral surfaces. And well, let's see, the next slide. So um, we're going to start the dissection portion uh, of this um, ana anatomic um, talk. Um, but if you have any questions or comments, this is my email that I use. Uh, jumps my phone automatically, so I'll be happy to answer any questions any comments that you may have. So I'm going to switch over to the dissection video. Okay, just waiting for it to load. Okay, so first we're going to start with the medial side. This is a right knee. So first, we're starting here with a little bit of superficial dissection. And just to orient you, I'll pause for a second. Here's your patella here. The top of your screen is proximal. The bottom of your screen is distal. Um, here is the uh, medial aspect of your knee. Lateral aspects here, and we'll get to that shortly. So the first structure we're going to show you here is the medial retinaculum which is right there as we're grabbing in. And as we're taking it down, you're gonna appreciate a, an area of robust tissue. And what that is, is your MPFL. And the significance is it provides stability to the patella, especially in the first 20 degrees of uh, flexion. So there it is, uh, I'll point it out one more time here, right there. And um, this is important because you can see patients with patellar instability. Um, and the reason that it's especially um, prominent in the first 20 degrees of flexion is that the uh, trochlear groove is not as deep as it is once you come into full flexion. And we're going to show that in a second. So uh, typically how people um, can injure their uh, the MPFL is non-contact twisting injuries with the knee extended and foot externally rotated. So here what we're going to do is release some more of the retinaculum and that's going to allow you to truly see what we're talking about here. So there, now you can see the articular surface of the patella and the distal anterior femur right there. And that's your trochlear groove. And you can see that at this in full extension, it's not very robust. So you're able to sublux the patella laterally. See how it's coming over like that. And what we're going to do here is we're going to take the forceps and actually use them to act as an MPFL of sorts. You see how we are able to hold it in place better than just the bony landmark. So... As you can see, it's come over one more time. We're gonna grab it. Okay. So the next part of this dissection, we're gonna look at a, a, a more medial aspect of the knee. So there's gonna be a little bit of a superficial dissection. Right there, some of the fat 
And the next thing we're gonna show you is the superficial MCL, um, which is gonna be pointed to right there uh, with scapel, yep. And next, uh, we're gonna go through some of the PES anatomy. We have sartorius, gracilis, and behind that is uh, semi T, which you're not seeing there. Um, the next tendon we're gonna look at is the distal tendon of the adductor magnus, which I'll point out, it is right there. There's a Dr. Magnus. And then we're going to look at semimembranosis right there. And the way you know that that's semimembranosis is it inserts more proximally than the pest. So uh, the next part of this section is um, identifying more of the semimembranosis, uh, releasing it, and then we're going to show you uh, the medial head of the gastrops. So as you can see here, again, semimembranosis. You can start to see the lateral head, of the, I'm sorry, the medial head of the gastrox there. Um, but it's going to be a little bit clearer. Uh, shortly. Okay, so some amenosis is released. Underneath it, you can see as the medial head of the gastrox comes up and inserts on the distal femur. And now, yep, it's very nice and clear right there. So now we're gonna move to the lateral side. This is a left knee. So, oh, let me turn off the sound so you don't hear me mumbling. <laughs> so this is some, actually, let me go back to that in a second to show some of the nicely labeled surface anatomy. Okay. So here you can see your patella. Again, uh, as with the last video, uh, the top of your screen is proximal, the bottom of your screen is uh, more distal. And here you can see your IT band coming in and sort of girdies. Um, Here's the fibular head. You can see the common peroneal nerve as it uh, comes around, and then biceps femoris. So the first thing you're going to see in this uh, video is um, some of a fascial release of the common peroneal nerve, and uh, I'll point that out as we go on. Just releasing it along the fascial plane. You'll see I'll actually use blunt dissection to continue it down. And I'll pause this again. Just a little bit. So here's Gertie's IT band's been removed at this point, so you can't see where it's coming over, but that's going to allow us appreciation of the more um, deep tissue. Here's bicep femoris, and again, common peroneal. So the next part, we already we have the bicep femoris uh, removed and reflected back. Um, so that's biceps again moved and I'll pause here. Again, just to orient lateral epicondyle, fibular head, lateral head of the gastrox, and the distal end of the biceps uh, now that we have uh, removed uh, its most distal end. So just dissecting out more of the lateral head of the gastrox and then the next video uh, will be showing um, some of your PLC. Okay, so here, um, that structure there is your ALL, anterolateral ligament. Then the next one I'm going to show is L LCL, right there. After that, I'm going to be coming down. You can see I grab briefly meniscus, and then I come under LCL to grab the distal, I'm sorry, the most proximal aspect of popliteus. And there it is after it passes under LCL. Uh, the next uh, structure right there is your popliteal fibular ligament right there that I uh, put the, bice, uh, the forceps through. And then there's your uh, lateral uh, gastrox head. And that's it. Thank you very much, Dr. Lynch. That was a great presentation and a, a good look at the knee anatomy. And thank you to Dr. Penna for doing that dissection and giving us a great video to look at today. Uh, with that being said, I'd like to open up the screen to Dr. Cherney. He is going to go next and talk about screening of an ACL prone female athlete. Okay, hello everybody. We good? We're all good, thank you. Yep. Okay. 
Good afternoon, and uh, I'd like to thank Dana, first off, for putting in a lot of hard work to arranging these webinars. And my talk today, uh, we're going to cover a lot of ground, is identifying risk for ACL tears in female athletes. And when I was putting this talk together, eesh. No, I mean not advancing that. Oops, sorry. No conflicts today. So anyway, putting this talk together, uh, I had given a talk in 1997, why the rise in female ACL tears. So. Uh, somewhere in the mid 90s, this started to become uh, a real hot topic. But in order to better understand the rise in ACL injuries in young female athletes, we have to go back to 1972. And that goes back to uh, the enactment of Title IX, which was part of the Education Amendments Act 1972. And that was considered to be uh, a follow-up to the actual Civil Rights Act of 1964. Title IX says, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. And that really, opened up tremendous opportunities for high school and college athletes. So what happened in the ensuing years? Uh, female participation in high school sports increased tenfold and in college sports fivefold. But then somewhere in the early 90s, the warning bells started to ring. Uh, we were recognizing that the competitive female athletes uh, seem to be experiencing higher rates of anterior cruciate ligament tears. And these are some of the articles that were coming out in the mid 90s. Uh, these articles were all presented at the major conferences. Uh, 1996, uh, Ed Voitis uh, noticed that there was something going on. Uh, he had actually spoken to me several years before that uh, as the team physician University of Michigan. One year they had all five varsity basketball players on their uh, women's basketball team toward their ACLs. So he just, at that time he said it, it, this couldn't just be coincidence and that's that whetted his in, uh, interest in this. Uh, same thing, looking at basketball injuries, uh, journal athletic training, 1996, Elizabeth Arendt, uh, 1999, uh, wrote a classic article, ACL injury patterns, uh, comparing collegiate men to women. And then starting in 1996, uh, Tim Hewitt, uh, biomechanical engineer, uh, started looking into why women were at risk and the concept of quadriceps dominant, where the quadriceps kick in first. Uh, this is one of his articles. We're gonna talk more about his, uh, his research. So this graph shows uh, ACL injury rates over uh, a 10 year period. The study came out of University of Alberta and over the 10 year period, what they found is that compared to the men, the women's rate averaged about 3.5 times greater uh, as far as frequency of ACL tears. And that is where the 3.5 increased risk comes from, from this, this one study. In this study, which comes from uh, the NCA injury surveillance system, looking at both men's and women's intercollegiate sports and uh, ACL 
injury tears, what's of interest is of the top six categories of highest injury rates, you notice that women's sports are in four out of the top six, and the only two men's sports that make it in there are spring football and uh, fall football. If you also look at this list, you'll see that comparing men's soccer, women's soccer to men's soccer, you see that in the same sport that the rate of ACL injuries to the women uh, occurs at a much higher incidence. So who are these female athletes who are at the greatest risk? Uh, we're gonna look at this from a lot of different angles, but depending on this, sport, obviously jumping, cutting, contact sports uh, are the high risk sports. But we also see things like age group for risk of female athletes tearing their ACL, uh, starting from the age six, uh, where the increase actually begins at age 11 and peaks at age 16, sort of coincides with the rapid growth spurt age 10 to 11. Uh, there's some lagging in proportional strength, especially lower extremities when you compare uh, girls and boys of the same age. Also, neuromuscular changes in the female athletes seem to lag behind some of their male counterparts. And as they uh, grow, their center of mass rises, which increases some of the at-risk forces to the lower extremities. So this graph comes from the Norwegian uh, National Knee Ligament Registry. And I, I put this up for one reason, and that's to look at this area right here. So the black dots are the women ACL tears, and the men are the circles. So much higher, but look at where that increase is. It's about that age 16 level. So, and if you notice that up until age, you know, early teens, there's almost no change, there's almost no difference between injury to girls and boys. Once you get to about 16, all of a sudden, the risk in female athletes skyrockets, but then you get down to the early 20s and it starts to drop. And throughout the rest of the age groups, women are actually at a lower risk of ACL tears compared to their male counterparts. So uh, keep in mind that this increased risk happens in a, in a specific female age group and patient population. And here's just another quick summary, greatest risk for ACL tears, female athletes, we talked about this 15 to 19 age peak, uh, high risk sports. And then of course, different sports, there've been tons of studies, different sports show different increases in ACL tears when you compare uh, female athletes to male athletes. So across all high school sports, ACL tears in female athletes increased 4.6 times in one study. College sports, four time increase. Men's and women's basketball, eight time increase in ACL tears when you compare uh, women to men. Uh, Tom Lindenfeld, soccer, six time increase women to men. Volleyball, four times. US Naval Academy, women have a 10 times higher rate of tearing their ACL in the four years at the Naval Academy as compared to their male counterparts. And in the professional ski circuit, uh, female skiers are at a 1.4 times higher risk. So traditionally, risk factors are broken into these four categories, environmental, anatomic, hormonal, and biomechanical, biomechanical motor. Uh, I don't know, there's something about that classification that didn't make sense to me. I would rather break it up into thinking of the knee and lower extremity 
static issues with regards to ACL tears, dynamic issues, and then kind of the miscellaneous other and physiologic. So when we talk about static, we're, we're talking about things that can't change. So all these things that are listed have been shown in some studies to uh, be responsible for increased risk for ACL tears in female athletes. So the size of the femoral notch, more narrow notch, increased risk. I have a slide coming up that'll talk about that. This is a, a much newer concept, posterior tibial slope, the angle of the articular surface on the tibia. Uh, and I'll talk about that also. Some studies suggest that increased Q angle, which has always been thought to be related more to telfermal pathology, may put female athletes at a higher risk. ACL size, we know that for a given body weight, that the ACL in male athletes uh, are, would be stronger than the female athletes. Uh, we're gonna talk about some of Tim Hewitt's work as far as ligament dominance, the, common, the concept of ligament dominance, meaning when the muscles aren't really doing their job, uh, they, don't, they, they can't protect the ligament, and so these forces uh, are transmitted directly to the ACL. Uh, something that you can't change, generalized ligamentous laxity. Uh, there's one uh, excellent study uh, that has been done, we'll talk about it in a minute, and then uh, the concept of subtalar pronation, navicular drop, probably could have been put in the dynamic category, but really has to do with how much shock absorption you get when your foot hits the ground and moves into a pronated position. So these dynamic issues, neuromuscular, what are the things that put the, the women at higher risk? Uh, Landing technique, which is not optimal, we're going to go into that. Lower extremity strength, uh, at a given age, in, the, in those mid-teen years, uh, the female athletes have much lower extremity strength as compared to their male counterparts. Core strength and balance, uh, we've been focusing on for years to try to decrease the risk for ACL injuries. The concept of Leg dominance, that would be your strong leg, your, uh, what, what's your kicking leg. Trunk dominance, uh, having to do with core issues and balance. And uh, a fancy name for reaction time, neuromuscular recruitment. And it seems that, in, especially in some of the younger female athletes and the other ones that are in that high risk group, uh, their reaction times are a little bit slower. And then we get into this miscellaneous category. Uh, why are female athletes at higher risk? What are the things we look at? So we've already identified that age factor, age 16. Uh, we're gonna talk about hormonal variation and how it affects ligament strength. This is a relatively new concept that Ed Voidus uh, wrote about a couple of years ago, the concept of fatigue failure. So his theory is that in the female athletes, uh, the ACL suffers multiple micro injuries uh, that ultimately weaken it and can lead to ACL tears. So we've talked about high risk sports, uh, jumping, cutting, twisting, contact. Not too many people talk about position in sports. Uh, but uh, obviously position in sport makes a big difference uh, as far as risk for ACL tears. Skill level, especially in the young female athletes, uh, once competitive sports became so popular, uh, a lot of the younger athletes were put into competitive levels where, where they were not ready. And uh, there's some thinking that because of the decreased skill level uh, that this may lead to the increased risk for ACL tears. Fitness and conditioning, 
Does fatigue in the course of a game uh, have anything to do with ACL tears? And then playing surface and shoe surface have been discussed uh, ad nauseum, but no evidence that there's increased risk for female athletes. So just you know, quickly to discussing hormonal levels, uh, three phases, uh, follicular phase, ovulatory phase, luteal phase. Uh, and in this follicular phase, right in here, estrogen and progesterone levels are at a relatively low level. Towards the end of the follicular phase, as, and as a result of these low levels, the laxity in the ligaments increases. There seems to be an, uh, an increased risk for ACL tears right in the end of the follicular phase and at the pre-ovulatory phase. Uh, to take it a step further, there have been some studies that look at the use of oral contraceptives in the 15 to 19 age group. Uh, we know that the oral contraceptives moderate hormonal fluctuations. And some studies have shown that this age group on oral contraception can see up to a 63% reduction in, ATL, in ACL tears. And if you look at all age groups who are on oral contraception compared to those who are not, there appears to be a 20% reduction in all age groups. So uh, this is something that has been talked about. I can't say that the science behind it is, uh, is nailed down solidly, but uh, there's good information that uh, oral contraception the use of oral contraceptives may mitigate uh, the risk for ACL tear. Now we talked about the intercolumnar notch. So here's the AP view of a knee. This is the intercolumnar notch between B and C. Uh, in girls, the notch gradually gets wider. And then by the age of 10 to 13, the size of the notch stabilizes. The distance between the outside of the condyles also increases. And then there's an index that you look at between the notch width and the bicondylar distance. And there is a difference between girls and boys uh, who are fully grown, uh, which suggests that possibly a narrower so here's a little narrowing compared to above. Uh, a narrower intercolumnar notch uh, may be one of the contributing factors to ACL tears. So this slide demonstrates posterior tibial slope. So here's your tibia, here's your tibial, tibial articular surface. And when the tibial slope is at a relatively small degree, the, uh, the knee stability appears to be a little bit higher. As the, on this slide, you can see the tibial slope has increased substantially. And what happens when, the, when that tibial slope falls off posteriorly, the distal femur wants to slide posteriorly. So what happens when the distal femur slides posteriorly? The proximal tibia wants to displace anteriorly. So those anterior shear forces and the strain on the anterior cruciate ligament increase. So this is something that's been fairly new the last two or three years, uh, looking at the significance of that posterior tibial slope. Uh, orthopedic surgeons actually kind of stole this concept from veterinary surgeons who actually, when they treat dogs with ACL tears, one of the common procedures is to address the 
tibial slope abnormality uh, in the dog. So uh, you'll, you'll be hearing and seeing more about that. Q angle, we'll just talk about briefly. Uh, so it's the angle formed by the longitudinal line from the ASIS to the patella and then the intersecting line between the tibial tubercle and the patella. Uh, we know that the average Q angle in females, 17 degrees, average Q angle in males, 14 degrees. But whether that is actually coming into play uh, as far as increased risk factors, it's hard to say. Theoretically, uh, it, you generally see it with an increased valgus alignment in the knee and therefore might have something to do with some of the valgus forces uh, on landing. So what are some of the other factors that can contribute to in increased risk for anterior tears in women? Uh, so th this was a, a very interesting study that looked at kind of genetic factors or, or family related factors and of course they came up with this three time increased risk for ACL tears. Uh, in this study they came out with about 10% increased risk of tearing contralateral ACL. So for a female athlete who tears one ACL, in this study they had a 10% chance of tearing the opposite ACL. Well, this is interesting. If you have normal knees, but you have one sibling that has a history of an ACL tear, your risk of tearing an ACL goes up to 18.5%. If you've already torn an ACL, and you have a sibling that has a torn ACL, then your risk of tearing the other ACL goes up. And finally, they looked at if you suffer a tear to the contralateral ACL, you've torn one ACL, if you're going to tear the other ACL, 83.1% of the time, it'll happen within two years of your first ACL tear. So this study, uh, this is where Hewitt and Voidus, there is a connection. You know, they both were Cincinnati Sports Medicine, where I did my fellowship also at the same time. So they paired up uh, on this study where they tried to look at the biomechanical aspects of why women athletes tear their ACL. So they found things like, uh, there's a tendency for the knee to be relatively straight on landing. Dynamic valgus as the knee goes into flexion on landing. They found that a lot of the ACL tears which occurred when landing, uh, the female athletes are coming down all on one side. And they also found that when they did come down on that one side, it made sense that the trunk was tilted uh, off center as well. So uh, Tim Hewitt came up with this concept uh, that's still considered uh, valid, trying to find out why female athletes tear their ACL. Uh, in one symposium where he gave a talk, he, he said that he had two daughters, both played soccer. In the course of their soccer careers, they both had bilateral ACL tears. So uh, I, that whetted his interest. So ligament dominance, that means when the muscles aren't strong enough to protect the ligaments. Quadriceps dominance, that's what happens when, uh, when you land and the quadriceps fire before the hamstrings. Uh, it tends to pull the tibia forward, whereas in male athletes, uh, when they land, uh, the tendency is for the hamstrings to fire first, which is protective uh, of anterior shear of the proximal tibia. Uh, concept of leg dominance, putting one 
extremity at higher risk, and then uh, the concept of core dysfunction, uh, which really speaks to balance issues. So what happens when there's a non-contact non ACL injury? We know that somewhere, you know, studies come out anywhere between 60 and 80% of ACL injuries, non-contact male and female. So two of the mechanisms, so one common is landing, where we'll see a few more slides of this. Knee goes into valgus, foot pronation, uh, and then cutting. So non-contact injuries while you're cutting. Usually the cutting uh, non-contact injuries, uh, the forces across the knee are varus and internal rotation. So this is what we see in many female athletes that we think puts them at higher risk. So as they land, the femur adducts, internally rotates, the knee abducts or goes into valgus, and the foot and ankle uh, pronate and ever. So this kind of shows like a good biomechanical landing position. Femur thighs parallel, feet uh, flat on the floor, no femoral adduction, AD, ADD, as opposed to this high risk position where the femur is adducted, where the knee is in increased valgus, and where the foot and ankle pronate. So now uh, I'd like to talk about you know, how do we start evaluating these female athletes, you know, when we see them from scratch, pre-seasons, you know, whatever. So on the physical examination, we can pick out a lot of these risk factors right away. We can see knee alignment, varus or valgus. We can measure the Q angle, varus or valgus. We can determine if there's generalized laxity. Generalized laxity is significant. Uh, one large study looked at, it was a retrospective study that looked at uh, female athletes who tore their ACL and they found a certain high percentage had generalized laxity. And when compared to the general population, that the ACL group had a much higher incidence of generalized laxity, uh, very suggestive that it may have some some play in, into their increased risk. We can look at overall strength and atrophy on exam. We do a knee stability exam, uh, testing the function of the anterior cruciate ligament and whether there's any rotatory instability. Uh, we can do balance tests. We can look at the subtalar drop to see the difference between a neutral ankle and a maximally uh, pronated foot and ankle. And here's one that nobody mentions, which is, is there a scar on the other knee? If there's a scar on the other knee, then you know that the knee that you're examining is at much higher risk, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So these, I'm calling them sideline evaluation assessment. They're basically functional testing. Uh, there's numerous, tests and assessment systems that have been uh, devised. I'm just gonna quickly, I'm, I'm not gonna go into detail, I'm just gonna quickly discuss them. So functional movement screening, I mean, that's basically just evaluating your athletes on the field, how they run, how they cut, how they, how they land. Uh, tuck jumps, two foot jumping up, knees to chest, and then landing, and then watching the position of the extremity when they land. Same thing for drop vertical jump. Uh, watch the position of the uh, lower extremity when they land. Uh, observational screening of 
dynamic knee valgus. So these all come into basic simple tests that anybody can do on the sideline. To get a little more involved, the LESS, landing error scoring system, where you jump, land, and rebound. There, it is then broken into a scoring system where you look for presence or absence of nine hip, knee, and ankle positions during, during landing. And you come up with a score, which can tell you which athletes are at higher risk. Uh, this has only been found to really be helpful in youth soccer, but some studies show that it can be uh, more effective. Uh, clinical based algorithm is the KAM, high knee abduction moment on landing. Uh, and that's where you use a camera to evaluate several variables. Uh, then you take into consideration mass and quad hamstring ratio. Uh, you plot it all on a graph and it, uh, ultimately on the graph, it'll tell you uh, what the increased risk is for that individual athlete. Single leg anterior reach uh, is really a balanced test uh, and single leg hop for distance has been shown to be an effective screen when you're looking at athletes uh, who've already had an ACL and you're trying to determine uh, when they're functionally ready to return to sports. This is another screening uh, testing system that's been evaluated, functional movement screen that uses seven tests, squats, hurdle step, lunge, straight leg raise, rotatory instability, and then they have a way of scoring and grading as well. Uh, that is fairly common. Once again, here's just to emblazon that in your mind, what an abnormal landing position looks like. Hyperpronation, knee valgus, thigh adduction, as opposed to a relatively straight uh, from behind when you're looking at this athlete. Landing error scoring system, jump from a height, land and jump up. And what you're doing is this is the key. You're looking to see what it looks like when they're landing. Are, are their knees going into that valgus? So for sideline evaluation testing or it, uh, in the clinic, you're really looking for functional movement screens, doing mod modifications of drop jumps, sports specific type activities, tuck jumps. Uh, and then I'm gonna just quickly go through the more sophisticated uh, way of evaluating these types of motion abnormalities and forces, and that's in the gate lab. So I had an opportunity to work with our gate lab at Stony Brook years ago, where we did look at some uh, ACL injuries. So what a gate lab can be used for many things. Uh, assessing injury risk in this situation, evaluating uh, post-injury and post-surgery patients uh, when somebody can return to sports. And of course, performance enhancement in pretty much any sport. Uh, it can be used for gait analysis, for things like uh, looking at golf swing, pitching analysis, uh, things like volleyball spiking, uh, mechanics on the cross shooting, tennis swing, track and field events. So the Gate Lab team, a bunch of different people that all have the same end in mind. So it'll be anywhere from orthopedic surgeons, sports medicine, therapists, athletic trainers, biomechanical engineers, usually a big part, kinesiologists, and strength and conditioning specialists. So here's a picture of a Gate Lab, which looks very similar to the Gate Lab that we now have at Stony Brook, uh, where uh, you have lighting and cameras. Uh, you have force plates on the ground. Uh, you have EMG and 
uh, for uh, muscle testing. So what can you do in a gait lab? You can uh, look at kinetics, force and moments. You can do high speed motion analysis, force plate, intersegmental moments, EMG, uh, which looks at dynamic component, 3D, 3D motion evaluation, balance, posture, energy expenditure. But it, so it, it's very uh, precise when you're looking at how you evaluate movement, gate lab using 3D markers and computer analysis uh, is really the gold standard. It requires sophisticated gate lab equipment. Uh, it's not cheap and you need technicians who, who know how to perform the testing. So, all right, so we've kind of identified all these high risk factors. Now, which factors can we actually do something about? So any neuromuscular issues, we might be able to have some impact on. Balance, strength, and core, those are things that we can improve. So these ACL programs, uh, ACL prevention programs, have been out there for years. Uh, some of them are definitely better than others. Some of them are easy to implement. So uh, we're gonna talk about them. Uh, and they have been shown to decrease uh, ACL tears in female athletes. So the PEP program is one of the oldest. It's been around since 2000, prevent injury, enhance performance. Uh, it's used to replace the conventional warm-up. And in some of the early studies, they showed that compared to a control group, that there was a reduction in ACL injuries in the female athletes up to 88%. Some of the later studies don't show that. Sports metrics is another ACL prevention program. Uh, it takes, tw it's 20 exercises in 20 minutes, it includes warm up, plyometrics, strength, flexibility, and agility. So for anybody who wants to get you know, more information, you're gonna to have to dig a little bit deeper because we just don't have the time to go into these in depth. As far as the most successful ACL prevention programs, these are things that we pretty much know, that the ones that seem to be most successful are the ones that include implementer training, meaning it's done with supervision. The, there's emphasis on landing stabilization. Uh, Emphasis on lower extremity strengthening. It targets the highest risk female athletes, those middle and high school athletes. And it is continued throughout the competitive season as well as the off season. So, so just kind of wrap it all up. It's a lot of information that, that we went through. The question is, so how do, you, how do we deal with these female athletes? You know, who needs to be evaluated? Who needs to be in a prevention program? This would be my recommendation. No matter what age, if you're involved in a low risk sport, I don't think you need an evaluation and you probably don't need to be in a prevention program. So if, if your sport is crew, you're not gonna tear your ACL. So it's not critical. However, keep in mind that if you have an athlete who's involved in a low risk sport, that maybe their recreational sports are not low risk, maybe they're skiers. So uh, you might wanna take a good hard look to see who might benefit from that. Now we're gonna go into the high risk sport category. So these are the female athletes involved in basketball, soccer, volleyball. In the female athletes under the age of eight and over the age of 22, there's not a significant, there, there still is a risk for ACL tears, but it's not a significant increase over their male counterparts. So in this group, I would recommend a sideline assessment, trying to pick up some of those high risk athletes that may be at higher risk. And I think they should be in a preventative program. 
Now we're going to move to the high risk sports in the high risk age group. So they must have a sideline assessment and they must be in a preventative program. And that program should be both in season and out of season. And then the last group is, I call it the high risk sport plus group. So you're in a high risk sport, you're in a high risk age group, and you have other factors. So, uh, for instance, uh, you have brothers and sisters and they've all torn their ACL. So you're all automatically in a much higher risk uh, than other people in this category. So these are athletes that may be best off evaluated in the gate lab where we get really specific information. You know, once again, issue with gate labs, uh, there are not that many around. We have one in Stony Brook. They're, ex they're expensive uh, because insurance generally doesn't cover it. And then these athletes, once again, high-risk sport, high-risk age group, other high-risk factors, uh, it's absolutely essential that they be put in a preventive program. Okay, I'd like to thank uh, Robin for helping me put this talk together. And, and that's it. Thank you very much, Dr. Cherney. That was a very wonderful presentation. Um, pulling up the rear, we have Jennifer Castelli, our physician assistant with Dr. Penna. I want to open up the screen sharing for Jen to give us a presentation on our ACL graft choice and how they decide based off of the patient and their needs. Uh, so Jen, screen goes to you. Hi, thank you, Dana. So much for all your hard work and everything you've done for this presentation. Um, I'm just gonna start my slideshow. Um, okay, so let me take this one second. I'm gonna stop my video. Okay, so. As, uh, we're going to talk about ACL uh, graft choice today. My name is Jennifer Castelli. I'm a PA that works with Dr. Penna at the Department of Orthopedics. I've been working there for approximately a little bit over 14 years. This is my favorite surgery, so I'm excited to talk about ACL graft choice today. Okay. Um, anterior cruciate ligaments are approximately 100%, 100,000 ACL reconstructions per year in the United States. And choosing a graft can be very stressful. Um, as anybody knows, that physical therapists or athletic trainers, when people, when young athletes tear their ACLs, they're very stressed. They don't know when they're going to get back to sports. So choosing a graft is probably at the bottom of their list, and they really do require help from their practitioners. And there's no perfect graft choice for everyone. There are risk and benefits associated with all the grafts, and we're going to go through them today. In a recent survey among members of the American Orthopedic Society of Sports Medicine and Arthroscopic um, Association of North America, the surgeon surveyed 45% uh, chose a quadrupled two tendon hamstring autograph, 41% chose a bone patella tendon bone autograph, and 18% chose a quadrupled single tendon hamstring autograph. Only 17% chose allograft. Uh, graft choices for anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction include allograft and autograft, and we'll go through them today. Autograft includes patel tendon, hamstring, and quadricep tendon. Allograft is, uh, you can, these are all different types of choices of allograft, uh, semitendinosis, Achilles tendon, hamstring tendon, patel tendon. We're not going to go through them, but we'll, we'll talk about risk and benefits. So over the last 10 years, Use of uh, allograft has increased due to the improvement of graft processing, which improves its safety profile. Allograft can provide excellent outcomes for the appropriate patient. So there are some patients that are older or want to get back to work sooner. So allograft is a good choice for them. Um, the, right after surgery, the, the pain um, is less, so it's much easier to get back to work. These are the benefits of allograft. There's an elimination of donor site morbidity that helps them get back to work sooner, there's decreased pain, 
there's a shorter operation time. And sometimes with uh, multi-lig reconstructions, we use allogram. The risks are there's increased cost. You have to pay for the graph. It's expensive. Um, there's longer incorporation times and there's a higher failure rate in the young athletes. So it's not something that we usually use for young athletes or we recommend for young athletes. Research has demonstrated that handling the sterilization process of the allograft can have significant impact on the performance of the graft. Depends on what type of sterilization process was used and in, in terms of how, how well it does and failure rates. I'm gonna spend most of our time speaking about autographs. It's what we mostly use, um, especially in the young athlete. There's patel tendon, hamstring, and quad tendon. I'm gonna go through each one of these. I'm gonna start with patella tendon. Uh, bone patel tendon bone autograft is still, for now, considered the gold standard. Uh, we say for now because ham lots of surgeons use hamstring, and so and there's new upcoming uh, grafts choices, including hamstring uh, and quad tendon that people have been using more often. So the most extensive data exists on on bone patel tendon bone results. So we have the most information on on this graph. So as hamstring and quad tendons have grown popularized, some surgeons would still go back to BTB for higher demand athletes. The reason why is because the benefits of bone to bone healing does theoretically allow return to sports sooner. Um, they're more likely to have tighter knees. When we talk about tighter knees, we talk about the um, KT1000, which is basically an arthrometer and a knee laxity testing device. It was designed to measure the anterior translation of the tibia while maintaining the femur position. So the measurements on the KT1000 arthrometer tend to be less, there's less laxity in the BTB. Autographs. And at least one study, uh, female athletes have fewer subsequent procedures and lower failure rates when compared to hamstring. Uh, BTB is recommended for the female athlete, young female athlete. So the risks of BTB are anterior knee pain, um, loss of extension. Actually, when we first started doing ACLs, um, a five degree leg and extension was considered normal, although now we get crazed about extension. We push to get extension because if any of the PTs know that having a five degree leg and extension, the patient's very unhappy. <laughs> so you have pain with kneeling and they have patellofemoral issues approximately 9%. And the patella fracture, which is, is very rare with harvest. This is a video that I'm going to go through um, of a cadaveric knee that we're harvesting the patel tendon. There's a left knee, there's a lateral side, medial side. I know Dr. Lynch kind of went through this already, but we'll just, it's going to be a harvest, so a little different. This is the patella. is patella tendon. That's a tibial tubercle. So we take the middle one third of the tendon uh, with bone plugs on both sides, both patella and tibial tubercle. We usually have a, a, a specific knife, a double bladed knife, uh, which we'll show, I'll show you in a minute. Um, He's just making incisions on the patel tendon. That's the, the knife we use, the double blade, nine millimeter, usually, not in this case. And the bone plugs on, on either side, so the tibial tube goes about 25 millimeters. On the patella, it's about 20 millimeter bone plug that we use a sagittal solder. Here we go. It's cutting down on the bone where the patella tendon attaches. I use a saw. Usually at approximately 45 degree angle on either side. 
for the tibial tubercle or the tibial sac. Showing him where to cut. You bury the blade there. You do the cross cuts and then you'll see the bone plug pop out. That's a tibial bone plug. Now they're going to cut the patella side. And you don't cut directly down on the patella, so you don't you risk of fracture. Usually you hold tension also in real time, not in the cadaveric knee, you hold tension on the patella graft. And that's the graft of the patella tendon. This is a, we usually fix the patella tendon. Okay, that was the patella tendon video. Okay, we're gonna talk about autograph, hamstring autograph. So over the past uh, few years, hamstring is now the most commonly used graft in the United States for ACL reconstruction due to the improvements of um, in fixation implants. Now we use a tensioning system uh, that's very strong. So the quadruple two tendon hamstring graft is used most commonly followed by quadrupled single tendon hamstring graft. Benefits of a hamstring autograft are there's smaller incisions, there's a larger graft, and uh, less anterior knee pain, 5% compared to 9% of the BTB. Hamstring risks include uh, no bone-to-bone -bone healing, the risk of damage to the infrapatellar branch of the saphenous nerve when harvesting, and the grafts less than eight millimeters are at risk of failure. There is increased incorporation time compared to BTB over. So um, I think there might be a lag in the video. Okay, I'm gonna close the PowerPoint just to show. So give me just a second so the video is not behind. Give me a second, sorry guys. Just trying to get the video. One second. Sorry about this. Okay. Right, this is a hamstring video. We had it working nice and good before, Jeff. Uh -huh. <laughs> I know it was not working. Uh, Penna said there was a little lag, so I didn't want it, <clears throat> want it to be. So this is the um, anatomy. Let me just go back. I just didn't explain that. Hold on one second. Uh, 
Okay, this is the medial aspect of the knee. It's a left knee. This is the gracilis here, the semitendinosus, and the satoris expansion. Let's show you how that looks once we get that out. Okay. So they'll make an incision. Jen, I, I don't think it's yeah. sharing the video for us. Okay, hold on one second. Let me stop it. Just make sure that you're going back in this. I think okay. it's still on. Well, I have to go share. back and share that other thing. With yeah, you. just you're sharing the PowerPoint now. So just change the option on your screen share to the different okay. window. Okay. Perfect. You're Can okay. You yep, you thank you. Okay, here we go. Can you see it now, Dana? Yes, we're good now. Okay. okay, so this is the medial aspect of the knee. It's a video. Thank you, Dr. Penna. This is the gracilis here. This is your semi T. And now we're getting a video of, of the har uh, hamstring breath harvest. He made a skin incision, and now we're going to get into the he scrapes down the fascia to, to reveal the MCL and the sartorius. This is the MCL. It's what he's scraping down now. This is sartorius expansion. It's right here. Full screen. He's taking down the Sartorius um, expansion here. And now he's going to tag it with his incision. This is just a representation of the MCL. This is where we're cutting. Then we're going to pull this back. So we cut this down, and he's going to pull it back. So there's just a torus expansion in your MCL. You see these fibers here at your MCL. Incision small, so it's not so easy to see. That's representing the suture. And then we pull that back. Now you, you're able to see. Okay, so this is the Sartorius here. You can sell us your, okay. <laughs> when you pull it away, you can see it. I'm just talking about when you pull this back. This is the semi T connection to the gastro, which we'll also see in a minute. That's a semi-T, and he's going to pull up. This is the gracilis. And he's pulling that back. That's the semi-tendinosis, and he's going to show us the attachment to the gastron. There it is. That's this here.
Now we're cutting it. This is the harvester. Show you, we, we show you on a this is how it works. You get you close it and then it goes around the tendon and then pulls all the way to the top and then there's a cutting mechanism and it cuts off the, from the muscle. So it says cut, lock, and that's how you get the tendon off the muscle. Pushes it all the way up, steady pressure, and then it pulls out. And that's your semi T graft. Now we also have a cadaveric hamstring harvest so that we can really see the anatomy, not in that small little incision we make. That's a sartorius expansion. And we have a tibial tubercle. The patella. And the muscle. It's going to pull back the sartorius now. This is where he makes the incision. That's for Telton and down. Taking that down, and then we'll be able to see the the hamstring, the semi T in the Brazil. Make sure you don't cut the MCL. That's what this is here to protect. Okay, there it is. Okay. So that's the situation when you pull it back and you see the, the semi T and the gracilis. There you go. There's the semi T. Pull that down. And now you're going to see the, um, the attachment to the, the gas drum. There it is.
Okay. And now he pulls it out. And he's the hamstring. Well, send me pretend I'm subscribed. Okay, let me stop that. Now I'm going to go to another. Uh, the prep, grab prep of the hamstring. Here we go. Okay. This is the hamstring prep. So again, after you harvest, cut it as much length as you can because you have to quadruple this prep. This is the graph on the back table. This is the ACL tightrope, which is one of the implants. One goes on the femur, one goes on the tibia. So you fold it in half, and you use um, this suture to attach both of the limbs together, so the fiber loop. Straighten it. That's the two ends. I'm going to just attach them together. It's just attaching those two limbs with that suture. Let me see if I can just okay. And then we quadruple it, put another fiber uh, ACL tight rope. It's gonna go to in half again. This is the second one. So one goes on one end, one goes on the other end. Now you put your the graph. And now you have to have all four limbs together. So I'll suture that. You measure, it has to be at least six. Centimeters for it to be long enough. Let me do it. This particular suture is called a crack out, or it's just a type of suturing. That's what it that's how you do it. You basically lock it on each end and come up and down either side. And it tubularizes it, makes it all one piece. So when you pull the graft in, it doesn't get caught up. And then we come out to the bottom. And these sutures that are tied around the graft, we pull through the button. And I'll show you how to do that. Take this little needle, the loop on it, and pull this two sutures down through the button. So when we tie it on the tibial end, it pulls the graft also. And now we check our, check the diameter for what you know what size it is and it should be eight or larger. Um, we use those little sizers. And that's your breath breath. Okay, just have one more to the OK, 
okay, we did this. And now I'm just gonna talk about quadriceps tendon. Um, autographs, it's only 1% of the surgeons consider quadriceps tendon for primary or revision ACL. It's the least studied ACL graph. And um, as studies increase, this actually may be the graph for the future. More people have been using it. Um, the benefits are there's lower morbidity. And I'm sorry. Some... We're not seeing that again. Just fix the screen oh. sharing setting. Mm -hmm. I thought I was doing that. Let me see. New share. Did. Did you there you see? go. Back on. Sorry about that. Okay. Thank you. So again, just 1% of the surgeons use the quadriceps tendon. It's the least studied ACL, but... As more people use it, it can, may be the graph of the future. We'll see. This is um, benefits of the quad tendon include lower morbidity and similar complications to BTB. They have a stronger extensor mechanism. The ability to choose the length of the graft is important. You have, we avoid the uh, infrapatellar branch of the saphenous nerve. Um, like in, in hamstring harvest, you, there's risk of that. And it's easier to harvest compared to hamstring and patella tendon. The risks include anterior knee pain, quadriceps weakness, decreased range of motion, and possible uh, patella fracture. Also increased bleeding, uh, leading to hematoma due to the vasculature in the area. So those are the, all the ACL graphs, and that's my talk on choosing graph for ACL reconstruction. Dana? Thank you so much, Jen. That Dana. was wonderful. Uh, it was a great summary of all of our graft options, and thank you to Dr. Penna for getting us some video from the OR and from the cadaver dissection so we can get a peek at how you guys reconstruct these ACLs for our athletes in the OR. Uh, at this time, I want to open up the floor. If anybody has questions for Dr. Lynch, Dr. Cherney, or Jen, you can type them in the chat box now. Uh, we'll give you guys a few minutes, and I'll keep this, this chat room open for about the next 10 minutes in case anyone has any questions. Reminder for physical therapists and athletic trainers for proof of attendance for you two. Uh, just make sure you email Patricia Lamb if you're a physical therapist and Christos if you are an athletic trainer. I sent around the email for the reminder of this meeting with the PDF form that needs to be completed for athletic trainers based off the certification there. Uh, each attendee of the webinar will be sent a survey by the Renaissance School of Medicine. Please complete this in a timely manner so the CME office can help develop future seminars and, and I can help guide you guys to uh, uh, have the best webinar that you're looking for. So if you have any ideas or any thoughts that we can make better or go over a different topic for you, please let us know. If you have any other additional questions or concerns with these webinars, you can feel free to contact me. My email is on the bottom there for you. Just a reminder that Stony Brook Medicine does have a YouTube channel. They did upload the foot and ankle webinar. Uh, the link is up there. If you would like me to email it to you, I can do that as well. So just shoot me an email with a request. Uh, this webinar on the knee will be up usually in about four to five days, I want to say. Uh, I get it approved through marketing and it'll be available for you. So I can uh, send you an email if you have an interest in this knee webinar for future viewing as well. Just a reminder that Stony Brook Orthopedics has the urgent care if you are getting outside and getting active and you find yourself in a pinch. We do have an orthopedic urgent care Monday through Friday, 3 to 6.30 p.m. at 14 Technology Drive, Suite 11. Just want to review our locations. We have East Atauket, Comac, Hampton Bays, Patchogue, and Stony Brook. If you'd like to visit one of our locations, please give us a call at the main scheduling line. I want to thank you for attending this webinar. The next segment will be held on Friday, September 11th. We'll be going over the HIP at that point. If you have any questions on registering, please let me know. If not, visit our uh, CME website so that you can register for the upcoming webinar. If you need an appointment with one of our physicians, feel free to call our scheduling line. And uh, just one question that popped up, Carrie, thank you. The YouTube is not eligible for CEU credit for athletic trainers. So it is only eligible for the educational credit as a live event. So when we upload it as uh, an educational uh, piece to your, your book of tools that you can use, it's not eligible for CEU credit at that time. And if anyone else has any questions, you may feel free to ask. If not, thank you to our physicians and uh, our physician assistants and everybody who attended this webinar today. Thank you for giving up a chunk of your afternoon. 
And we look forward to seeing you in September when we are on our third piece of our webinar on the hip. Have a great weekend, everybody.